My primary interest and concern with this program is to get kids uh, who are, for whatever reasons, um, sometimes rootless and sometimes without direction, into a field that is a very exciting field and that can turn into a profession for them. There are, there's a lot of talent uh, in the Rock Against Racism kids. There's a lot of talent among kids, period. And if we can teach them <coughs> the media, if we can teach them how to script, if we can teach them how to run a camera, if we can teach them how to switch and direct, and to do all those things, we're giving them uh, a leg up on something that's going to be very important for their generation uh, as well as ours. And I think that's that's m the major reason that you know that I'm involved as a technical director and as a supporter of the program. And um, the new program coming up that Fran talked about a little bit will give those young people a real opportunity to see what kind of skills they can acquire and apply uh, to cable television and eventually to network television. We hopefully will turn on our televisions, you know, five to ten years from now and see some of the kids who are involved in the Rock Against Racism program working to change not only uh, their lives, but the society as a whole. Tell us how, a little bit about how you got involved in what you did with Rock Against Racism. Well, you know, I got and involved. Why, yeah, yeah, but you're right here for you, what? Okay. I got involved because of you and Mackie McCloud and Reby and my little group of folk that were always in my front room. Messing with my furniture. <laughs> and his room was right above us. <laughs> Wearing out that one rug that I had. <laughs> And challenging the hardwood floors. <laughs> and we decided to do this because Fran said, we ought to do something. And I said, yeah. And she said, I'm not sure I can. I said, don't. I don't want to hear that. We're going to do this if we're going to do this. And we got involved. And we started working with all the young people in the room, the young people who are now old. <laughs> this lady is never going to be old. <laughs> we decided we were going to do something nobody else had ever done. And we were going to do it in a way nobody else had ever done it. And a lot of the things that have happened around the country happened because we started them off right here. And for all that time, Miss Fran, Miss Smith, um, was pushing with one hand and pulling with the other hand. And I had to keep her standing up because sometimes she wanted to fall down. But we got her to stand up. And then she stood on everybody else. <laughs> and we got the job done. And I appreciate all the time and all the energy and all the strength from all the young people. And the fact that, you know, people told us we couldn't do it. And the last thing somebody ever needs to tell me is I can't do it. Amen. And I said, who the hell are you? To tell me. <laughs> That's right. Thank so you, we Dan. did it. That's yes, right. We did it. That's right. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, not everybody has the opportunity to grow up uh, with a hip-hop family. Uh, I had the pleasure of raising a hip-hop family and had the pleasure of being around a man who is my father, 
uh, and uh, we were in his house wearing out his floor and uh, little by little he saw what we were doing and uh, really, really encouraged us to continue the fight. So I'm going to sit here and read this little piece. It says, Mackie and Dan were both part of the Roxbury Task Force on cable television, instrumental to getting the first community access studio in Roxbury while it's still there. It's still there to this very day. A question for you, Dad, <laughs> is uh, how about the impact and how is it now? The, the impact uh, reverberates still. And it must never stop. There's a thing called an echo. And, you know, some people think the echo goes away. Once that echo begins, it lasts. And it lasts forever. That pebble in the stream keeps going. Hey, talk about that. And rocking against racism began to go from a little seedling to a movement that, you know, has come to be a real part of the lives of everyone in this room. And Mackie is not with us now in person, but he's a part of all of us. And some of you will see that. Um, his daughter's still alive. She teaches in the Boston Public Schools at the Agassiz in Jamaica Plain. And the other person was Mel. And Mel, you know, never slept. Funny thing, you know, people talk about, oh, I've got to go rest. Well, Mel never rested. And as was said very famously by Frederick Douglass, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Eternal vigilance. Do you all know how to spell eternal do you all know how to spell vigilance? And that's one of the things that Jose has done every week. And in those weeks, every day of in those weeks, he said, we are one. We are one, and you have to remember that. And Mel, who just celebrated his 92nd, I believe, birthday, 95 first. Sorry about that. I've got to give credit, all the credit. Mel did a, a wonderful, and it's still a wonderful work. Um, Don West is in the audience out here. He's sitting here calmly, not taking pictures. But he's been one of the chroniclers of the Mackey days and the, the Mel days and the Chuck Turner days and the Jose Masso days and the Rebe Garofalo days and the days of a young lady who barely could get out, I think I need some help. And that was probably the last time that the lady in the middle of this dance we're having in the middle of this wonderful concoction of beauty and rage and glory. Um, and that little boy or girl up there screaming. Um, somebody said, quiet the baby down. I said, no, don't quiet the baby down. Let the baby do what the baby's got to do. She is our future. She or he is our future. And sometimes she'll see a video of, of this too. But I want to say to my son, one of my sons, one of the children of this oh, convolution, I won't call it revolution, but convolution, that we are very happy to have had you, Mackie, to have you still. Very happy to have you, Mel, to have you still. And we're very happy for that child because that child is us. Thank you, Dad. Love you, Dad. <laughs> well, you know, my name is Dan Richardson. Uh, and 
what my role was over time was supporting Fran. Mackie McLeod brought me in okay. and said I had to meet Fran, uh, that she was the one that needed the help. And I said, fine, I'll meet her. And, you know, we met and we talked. And I said, fine, I'll help out if I can. Uh, and I told her some of the things I was doing. I'm, that's your What I was doing was producing uh, TV for BNN, for Boston Neighborhood Network. Uh, and I wasn't the technical director. I did that, but I did everything else, too. Fran was a producer, basically. Uh, and I was doing the day-to-day -day directing stuff. Um, but she didn't have any television experience, right? Mm, like so, that she did when I finished with her. exactly. But that's why you were right. you were there. And um, we collaborated on a number of things, uh, and she basically had the idea for Rockets Racism, along with Ruby, and. Um, I just happened to, long, to come along and the scene because Mackie introduced me. Just tell me about Mackie McLeod um, because he was a crucial cog in this Rock Against oh, Racism wheel. Mackie was an activist, a uh, community organizer, much the same as I was at that point um, because that's how I got involved with, with uh, the Roxbury Studio was beginning the process in Boston and how um, we got RAR off the ground with the video stuff. Well, actually, let's talk, because uh, you're uniquely qualified about this for many reasons. Um, tell me about the media landscape for people of color in the 70s and 80s. Well, there were always a few people uh, that were in the media business. Um, Channel 2, especially, uh, was doing stuff. Barbara Barrow, Murray, uh, Sarah was, Sarah Ancho was involved. A guy, interestingly enough, coincidentally enough, was named Richardson, Ray Richardson, uh, who some people know. Uh, and there were other people there, um, many of whom ended up you know, in, in the business of video. Uh, a, a special uh, kind of attention was paid from, from, uh, from Channel 2, who had more people than anybody else. But interestingly enough, at that time, the three major news stations in Boston uh, seven, five, and four all had black anchors. Lavelle Diet uh, was at one, and Jimmy was at the other one, and um, uh, there was a guy, I'm trying to remember all of his name. He was a uh, movie star, Terry. Uh, was involved. Um, but how did it feel? How did the power feel? Did you feel like you well, had an actual voice? I mean, obviously, a lot of that was came out of the Kerner report. Well, you would agree. Well, yeah, I guess I have. I would have no choice because I was part of that mm -hmm. whole process. But you uh, were trying to start the Roxbury Studio as a not as a power move, but as a way to give even more voice to the people of color uh, in the city of Boston? Both, is that correct? It was both voice and power um, because we would be producing our own stuff. Um, and we paid particular attention to training young people. I trained a couple hundred young people on how to run you know, a studio how to set up and how to light and how to do all those different things. Uh, and then they had to produce a piece of their own and then they went from there. So how did this, um, how did your work, uh, when you got into the Rock Against Racism orbit through Mackie and Fran, 
Um, how do you feel that that impacted the people who are involved with it? I mean, I, I think an event like this is amazing because people can actually tell you you may not have seen some of them for 20 or 30 years. I saw most of them. You did? Good. Um, not a lot, but I saw them. The most significant ongoing project was RAR, and I wanted Fran to learn how to do it. Now, I'm not sure. <laughs> that she was ever really into that, but she was into what it meant. More importantly, she was into what it meant and, you know, how it was going to affect people. And as I said, you know, we trained a couple hundred folk. They learned the business. And we had um, cooperation from the public schools in a way because we had a studio at Madison Park High School wasn't terribly wonderful, but... You had one studio. in the building? It was there. Huh. Didn't work in the summertime because it was too damn hot. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the school department didn't set aside enough money for uh, air conditioning after a point. What do you think is the lasting legacy of, of Mass Rock Against Racism beyond even your involvement in the technical aspect? Well, how, how do you look at it this many uh, years I'm later? I'm not sure... There is a lasting legacy in the way that most people think. I said it pretty much um, at the beginning about, you know, you know the, uh, the pebble in the pool never stopping, and the ripples, and the fact that the echoes went on to many other places. Um, rock Against Racism is very much alive. Um, because of the people it, it trained, because of the people it nurtured, because of the platform it created. And that platform still exists. Um, it never went away. Um, it's not hyperactive <laughs> like it used to be, but it's very real.